to do today, it's a, it's a long-standing Imagining America tradition to bring our full selves uh, into the space and to tell stories. So I'm going to begin, and this is especially for you who are engaged graduate students um, or junior faculty. Um, I'm going to start today about a little bit of story of my own journey as an engaged scholar. And then I'm going to share, uh, and really for the first time, so you're getting a sneak peek, uh, some of the lessons learned from the first year of a three-year project to really look at how to support the work you're doing and how to really bring a national message forth to transform higher education to better support public engaged and activist scholarship, specifically in humanities, art, and design. So after my little brief uh, story, I will share a bit about what we're finding uh, from this first year of research. We're moving into year two of the three-year project, and I'll also share what's up for the coming year, which actually includes some opportunities for you all to tell your stories and share with us to be included in the final national campaign to really pressure um, stakeholders to listen to this work. So, so I'll share a bit about what's next as well. Um, okay. So my story, which is not over, obviously, and it's not always easy to be an engaged scholar, um, begins when I was at, I would say, Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Um, before that time, I was born in Berkeley, California in 1968. So that just says something there. These were crazy times and my parents were crazy people. My mom and dad were involved in radical school reform stuff before it was called school reform. It was really about the open classroom and building upon the freedom school ideas and the storefront schools. A lot of folks in the 70s were trying to create radical schools, pre-charter school. These were uh, part of the public school system. Think about Black House for the Black uh, Power Movement, uh, Casa de la Raza, and my family had a crazy school called Other Ways which was about teaching and learning in other ways. So long story short, my mentors, my babysitters, my dinner table was surrounded by people doing engaged education. But I was a shy kid. I was a very shy kid. My parents moved up to Mendocino County when I was nine and I had a, I'd say sort of a back to the land uh, teenage childhood in rural Northern California. And I was pretty shy. I got to read college, I fell in love with the classroom. I fell in love with humanities. I fell in love with the liberal arts and the idea of there are containers to have difficult conversations. You don't have to be that bold activist person out in the world to do something. You can really listen, sit, think, conduct research, provide a service to folks in communities by listening and sharing back what you found. For a shy person, I blossomed. I loved the classroom. It gave me questions that I was supposed to answer to, but also at Reed College at the time, um, you know, really curated intimate spaces of thought and learning. But it was a very traditional academic space as well. Despite what people think about Reed College being a radical university, it was, I was a sociology major and it was Marx, Dirk, Hyman, Weber. I needed to learn all the gods of, of sociology in order to pass a test to even be able to write my thesis. So I had what was a mock dissertation qualifying exam that I had to take to write a sociology thesis. And I thought, and I don't know, maybe this was in my DNA, but I can't do this without being on the ground and understanding the issues I want to write about and study. And I had fallen in love with E.P. Thompson's The Making of the English Working Class and being a rural teenager, I love this idea that there was rural rebellion, the idea of the Luddites and the people who smash machinery and rural farm workers fascinated me that rural people could actually also create change in the world. So I called a family friend, given my social movement childhood upbringing that I described, and his name was Miles Horton. He's passed away, but he was the founder of a place called the Highlander Center in Tennessee that is a, a, a pretty known long-standing social movement organization that really wasn't about the organizing and frontline activism, but was really more about bringing people together who are experiencing poverty, who are experiencing oppression, to come together and themselves understand what they're going through and create strategies for change. So it's a place where Septima Clark studied, it's a place where Rosa Parks studied, Martin Luther King was there. 
<clears throat> and Miles was, you know, when I was a, a teenager, I thought just some old white hillbilly from Tennessee. I had no idea his, his place in the universe. But I knew we ran this rural center in Tennessee and I literally dropped out of Reed and I called Miles and I said, I need to learn about rural resistance. <laughs> and rural rebellion and people who are making a change in the world in rural places and in true Highlander fashion he said you won't learn from me I'm just a person you won't learn from Highlander it's just a place but call Helen Lewis and Dr. Helen Lewis is an amazing woman who became my lifelong mentor as an engaged scholar she has been faculty at Berea uh, at Georgia Tech many other places and Helen in true Highlander fashion said you won't learn from me either but I am working <clears throat> with this woman whose name is Maxine Waller, and she is organizing her community. She's a, a coal miner's wife in a small town called Ivanhoe, Virginia on the North Carolina, Virginia border. And they've lost all the industrial base in their town. They also lost the coal mines, they lost Union Carbide, they lost the high schools, they lost all services for their community. And they were in a fight, in a battle to save the industrial land so they could do grassroots community development in that space on their own terms. So third chain down, I call Maxine Waller and she says, Erica Lee, Jesus must have sent you. Of course, I have no Lee in my middle name. But long story short, I fell in love with Maxine. I fell in love with being a researcher and ethnographer. I kept 10 diaries. I helped with the local oral history project, not unlike a lot of the preservation and neighborhood storytelling projects you're engaged in at UC Merced. Um, I was still a shy person, but I could take photographs of people's family photos. I could conduct oral histories. I could do calligraphy for their local projects and I spent a year really learning about transformative grassroots community development work and my role as a listener and as a thinker and as a questioner and a documentarian. And I also learned about centrally, and this leads to the research that Robin described in the Central Valley, um, the power of a community who actually thought that all of the problems were their own fault. They thought the coal mines left because they weren't good enough miners. They thought Union Carbide left because their land wasn't good enough. They thought the high school left because their kids weren't smart enough. And going through a community engaged research process helped them see themselves on the map of history and understand that this was a global assembly line problem. Union Carbide moved to the Maquiadoras on the Mexico border, right? So I saw and witnessed a process of a people completely transform and take ownership of their community and their lives and understand themselves as agents of change. Um, and uh, it's a longer story that's written and I can share the book that Helen Lewis wrote with Maxine Waller, but it involved local plays and feminist Bible studies classes and people's economics classes. So it was a, it was a crazy time. Um, my story shortens here where I basically just took this kind of work back to working in the nonprofit sector for all of my 20s. Uh, in the Bay Area, in the Central Valley, um, also my early 30s. And I met colleagues of Robbins at the Penn Valley Institute in Fresno. That's an amazing immigrant rights and popular education group that became very good friends of mine. So I worked as an organizer, community development, popular education, always with an action research kind of angle. I had a moment of, of vast, I would call now, naive disillusionment with the nonprofit sector when I saw the way foundations came in and limited the hopes and dreams of the organizations I was working with and said, yes, well, you can do youth leadership, but you can't tackle, tackle racism amidst the faculty in the public schools. Yes, you can do farm worker civic participation, but we don't want to touch big agriculture. And so I always, again, in love with the classroom, returned to get my PhD at UC Berkeley. And this is the part for you engaged grad students. I think I struggled for a couple years. My first project was I wanted to research how to create a Highlander Center West Coast. And I was told by many advisors that is not a dissertation project. <laughs> the second project I wanted to do that I wrote papers about was the cultural organizing model of the Pan Valley Institute that I work so closely with really using art and culture and storytelling and indigenous cultural traditions to build civic participation, identity, strength, and political power in Central Valley immigrant communities. No, this is not a dissertation topic. This is a practice guide. This is not a dissertation topic. One day, 
I was in the office of Jillian Hart. I believe that's my email coming in. I'll have to shut that down. Uh, who's a, a political geographer who's since retired from UC Berkeley. And she said, Erica, your dissertation is in your footnotes. And in my footnotes, I was saying, all of this work could be amazing if the funders, this, that, or the other, and griping about the funders and every other footnote. So my dissertation, for better or for worse, became a critical ethnography of the ways in which big funders interact with farm worker and immigrant organizing in California's Central Valley, with one case study of the farm worker movement and Cesar Chavez and Dolores Puerta's struggles with funding and two anonymized ethnographic case studies later on looking at really big Central Valley wide uh, health and community development initiatives where funders, again, long story short, would always support projects that ask farm workers, immigrants and poor community members to help themselves and solve their own problems, build leadership skills, learn how to eat better, learn how to be involved in your community, but would never, ever, ever tackle pesticides, big agriculture, sexual financial abuse in the fields and everything that was coming up for my research subjects. Um, now, what gets, to, um, what gets to the challenging part about that, I was honored and blessed and privileged to write that dissertation that eventually became my book, The Self-Help Myth. It was such a privilege and honor because folks still on the ground doing that organizing work had to keep their doors open and had to negotiate funding. They needed that funding to still do the critical farm worker work that is service provision work can be very radical work when people are in desperate need, right? And so I was in a unique position and this was not an engaged project. Here I come to UC Berkeley with all this history of collaborative action research and I said, Heck no, this is a story I want to tell. <laughs> this is a project that needs to be told. And I don't see foundation program officers and consultants as my collaborator, collaborators or the directors of the nonprofits. And so it was a great project. Hopefully it was useful to some people in the field who care about social movements, who care about philanthropy. But what it did, and this will lead to the leading and learning initiative that I'm going to share with you shortly, is it dichotomized my hopes and my dreams and my identity into multiple silos, much like the silos of our university. I became a critical thinker, a critical scholar, angry with everything and believing that you can't really understand the world without understanding the Gramsci or the Stuart Hall or the most critical analysis. I became part of that UC Berkeley culture that is so about, you know, having the most critical argument to the point that I arrived at my very first faculty position at the new school in New York City, which I loved so much. I had such a great time there teaching my students who were nonprofit management master's students critical theory. My students came back to me and said, what are you talking about? We're working in these organizations. We need to know what to do. And I went through an undoing process. I went through a deep undoing process because I was telling my students, you can't study the future. Plan a plan for the future is not research. A model of how things work isn't research. You have to get to the most critical problematic. And while I still believe in that, and you'll see it in the leading and learning initiative, that's what we spent our first year doing. Um, it was not of any service to my students who were like many of you engaged in the world engaged in organizing, engaged in service through nonprofits who had jobs outside of their scholarly careers. And I had such a beautiful time learning and teaching with my students. I created a class called participatory community engagement, where we talked about the high critical theory, but then we talked about ourselves in our lives and our work. And what does this mean for us? And how are we going to negotiate the organizations and the institutions we still deeply care about? And we did build plans for the future and we learned how to facilitate dialogues and we went out there and worked with community partners. So it was a radical undoing for me. I also had um, many naive awakenings at the new school as a junior faculty when I realized that I was a solo agent and that every single deliverable I had was about an individual, not a collective measure individual office, individual course development. My boss was tenure, not a group of people. Um, and so I went through a series of naive awakenings, the, the worst of which was that service, when you're reviewed, does not mean working with a community that you care about. It means a committee in an institution. And so again, the, the academic training that I went through 
compartmentalized myself and my life in the structures of the system, not in the structures of who I am and what I cared about in my life. And I know that um, through the, the three years I've been privileged to lead Imagining America, that this is not by accident, it's not by coincidence, and it is not a unique experience. That many engaged graduate students struggle with trying to do work that our academic institutions are not designed to support. And so this is my segue into a little bit of sharing with you about what we're trying to do through the Imagining America Leading and Learning Initiative, which is, which is really a goal to try to understand those systems and structures and cultures that make it difficult for people to do engaged work starting in graduate school all the way through early careers. Um, and then more importantly, how we create change. <laughs> how we foster different communities inside our institutions that really support and lift and promote this work, um, not unlike you're doing at UC Merced. And so I'm gonna shift to a little bit of screen share um, to tell you a bit about what we're working on here. And just give me a second to hope it works right here. So the Imagining America Leading and Learning Initiative is a three-year project uh, funded by the Mellon Foundation with uh, really three central goals. Uh, the first goal is, as I described, to really understand institutional culture in higher education in the ways that it has not supported and can better support public engaged and activist scholarship, specifically in art design and humanities. Um, and with the goal of creating proposals for change. The second real goal of this initiative is to build a powerful network across this country. And this is uh, one of the formations of our network with, that we call our leadership cohort, where we're bringing together key thinkers who have for a long time, this isn't a new question, right? Who for a long time have been looking to support institutional change in higher ed to better support engaged work, specifically in art design humanities. So we have Joy Connolly, the head of ACLS, Paula Krebs from MLA, other folks like Nancy Cantor, who's been a university president, who's been pushing for this work for a long time. Uh, John Powell at UC Berkeley, who's really talked about how to create spaces of belonging in higher education. Um, so if you, and I can share the information of our leadership cohort list and all the other materials with you uh, after uh, today, if you're interested. So the second goal is as we do this research, as we understand what the real problems are and the real hopeful spaces of change that we have built a network that can help get the word out and share and also contribute their own knowledge and wisdom to how we're really gonna make this change real. The third goal of the project is to create not just another white paper, but some dynamic actionable tools that we can share and spread. And if we were not in COVID, let's hope we're not by the third year of the project, get out across the country and do workshops. We're hoping to develop games. Um, I have a vision of a, a Shoots and Ladders meets Game of Life for junior engaged grad students to think about their decisions and their trajectories as they become an engaged scholar along the way. Also critical questions that we might give to departments for faculty to ask each other to really better understand what engaged work looks like and how they can better support their students. So the third year is really uh, a year that we're calling a communications campaign, but it's really a year of organizing to build and create and share some tools for people to do this change work on their campuses and in their communities. So um, the first year of the project, we really listened and learned about what are the problems. Uh, culture change has become a really trendy term. We're gonna create institutional culture change or to shift institutional culture, but seldom really looking at, well, what is the institutional culture? What, what is going on on our campuses? From the micro interactions we have with colleagues uh, to the broader messages and stories that are told. So the first year we spent really understanding what are the institutional cultures that have supported or that have very seriously marginalized public engaged and activist scholars in art design humanities. So we conducted uh, interviews with everyone you see on this map here. Um, we had some online engagements that were graphically facilitated, which this image uh, comes from. Um, we also have two research teams of uh, engaged graduate scholars 
uh, asking questions and conducting interviews and additional research on the graduate education experience. So we're, we're really lucky, uh, Alana Stein and Lisbeth uh, de la Cruz Santana are engaged grad fellows with the D D Davis Humanities Institute Mellon Public Scholars Program at Davis, who've conducted 20 interviews with uh, former alum, uh, alum of that program to find out their challenges and experiences. And our PAGE leadership is now embarking on a national research project to look at the engaged graduate student experience this coming year under the leadership of Romo and Gail Greenlee, who are both alum of the PAGE program and former PAGE co-directors. So we really are focusing on the engaged graduate education experience as well. Um, so I'm gonna go through, um, and I'm looking at time. I wanna make sure we have time for question and answer. I'm gonna go through now one of the ways that we're thinking about the findings from the first year that look at the problems, the problematics of institutional culture. Don't get too depressed, <laughs> given this time when we don't want to be depressed, we want to be uplifted, because the year that we're embarking on this current year is to look at positive case studies of people who've done amazing work to shift institutional culture and to build campus community alliances. So that's coming forth this year. But we did feel that we needed to ask some questions of this leadership cohort you see, see right here and additional interviews and additional research on what are the real problems engaged scholars from graduate student on up to early career are experiencing. And so what I'm gonna share with you is a framework that we have, um, develop just to get our heads around some of the themes and I call it the culture is dot 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 uh, framework. So I'm going to go through some of the main cultural traits uh, that we heard from this leadership cohort that you might be surprised to hear from a group and if you look around this table that are mostly deans, provosts, presidents, association presidents, um, grad student leaders, um, and folks in leadership positions at their own institutions. This is not a um, grassroots activist perspective. However, the first thing we found, and I'm gonna need to see if I can, wait, there we go, is everybody said, and these were anonymized interviews, so I can't tell you who said what, but a president of some sort or another said, look, institutions of higher education are essentially capitalist class structure, class structures internally. And there are ranks and there are classes and it's built upon long standing patterns of theft and oppression. We heard this from multiple presidents, multiple deans, multiple provosts, using different varying terms, some colonialism, some capitalism, some high level bureaucracy, some elitism, but almost everyone in our leadership cohort with just a couple exceptions talked about the necessity to really understand at the high level that many of our institutions including our own that i believe in our public universities as i said i deeply appreciate the engaged work at uc davis uc merced but many of our institutions were able to garner resources through theft of indigenous land so we don't give native land acknowledgements just to pay respects, but to recognize that our very institutions in society are actually built on theft. This is a beautiful article uh, called uh, Land Grab Institutions in High Country News that actually shows us the monetary gains from our land grant universities across the country that were made on not only stealing parcels of land from indigenous communities in our regions, but then selling it for profit to other white colonial land owners. So we also had folks who talked about, because we, we have a leadership cohort from across the country, how the profits of slavery, which is very beautifully captured in this book, Ebony and Ivy, um, have been made possible um, by profits made on the slave trade. And so this was surprising to us. This was quite surprising to us that folks of this leadership level would say, look, we have to understand the structures in which we're working. Some more hopeful than others, right? So, some said, where are, we, where are we with then, right? Now, some looked at what, um, what, would, what would be comparable to Roderick Ferguson's analysis. He's a scholar of higher education. And he looks at how over the years, these patterns haven't just disappeared, 
but they have been reincorporated through very moderate, let's say diversity and inclusion or mobility focused programs that kind of try to moderate, let's say the social movements of the 60s, the third world liberation movement that really tried to create spaces for community based scholarship. Um, that meant giving resources to communities and giving resources to folks This maps on to race, gender, ability, and, and material means uh, that universities have said, we will give you these spaces. We will give you a marginal ethnic studies program, but we won't continue to fund it. You have to fight for the faculty lines over time. We will give funding to diversity offices and administrative posts at the top. And so there are scholars and there are folks in our leadership cohort who continue to problematize the ways in which universities don't just rest on this history, but have reincorporated a lot of the challenges to change into very moderate programs without fully resourcing work that is community engaged or as uh, Sean you had shared with us that really gives resources to communities and brings folks inside and folks from the inside out. Um, so this was a space I, you know, I have to say that was quite surprising. Within, within, the, um, within the question of context and place, of course, people also share the deep challenges our universities have faced, especially here in California with the university system being defunded uh, over the course of time in the 80s, which then led to tuition increases and other kind of seismic shifts that really changed the nature of the capacity to do engaged work. Um, of course, our study looks at all the different university types so a different context for community colleges, a different context for R1s, a different context for state, for liberal arts, et cetera. So uh, it doesn't really tell the whole story to talk just about um, these private and, and public land grant institutions. So next finding is our leadership cohort told us, and this actually came from provosts <laughs> predominantly and deans that shared with us the culture is also very slow moving and conservative. And I don't mean conservative on the radical conservative scale of things, but that our institutions move very slowly. They're conservative in that they don't like change. These are some quotes uh, from our interviews. Higher education institutions are resolutely status quo and assimilationist. Most universities are very conservative and use resources to preserve the old system and power at the top. An interesting, um, and this may not be a newsflash to many of you, that oftentimes administrators at the top are very excited about engaged work. They're very interested in speaking to regional stakeholders, to having an impact in their regions and support engaged work from the top, even sometimes through resources and the founding of centers and divisions. But faculty peers wield a lot of power and we had a lot of conversation and I can get into it in, in question and answer if there are, is an interest in discussing here, but a really um, interesting dynamic in every single interview that came up. And this goes to the humanities in particular, where faculty who came up through the kind of traditional modality of classics, of English, of literature and themselves had to fit within the framework of some in our interviews called it the book obsession. You know, the over book, you have to write the book and then you have to write the second book and then you have to write the third book. People who had to write within the lines a certain way held on fiercely to their position by not allowing any other modalities or approaches into the space. This comes down very difficultly for engaged graduate students and for engaged uh, faculty peers, especially junior faculty peers, who are trying to do this work and continually told that's not the way you do it. That's not how it works. Uh, this doesn't count. Um, also, not really understanding, and, and I know those of you doing engaged work understand this, the length of time it takes uh to do engaged work right that this is actually a sense of rigor is your time that you've spent in community in relationship with folks actually is rigor and so it's partly a holding on to one's space you know and holding power but another is a lack of conversation to be honest and a, a lack of understanding of what it takes to do deeply engaged work and so faculty peers were discussed as as very important and, and serious brokers of power um, I'm going to read here just a couple quotes from the engaged graduate student research 
that speaks to the graduate student experience in this space. And these, again, were anonymized interviews of UC Davis alum of the Davis Humanities Institute Mellon Public Scholars Program. Their quotes also show, which was central to our research findings of how these challenges also deeply map along racial, gendered ability and material need lines, right? They're, they're deeply interconnected here. Um, one, one student says, um, when I got to grad school, I think I had this image that a lot of research was driven by activism and I had that goal. And I realized when I got in, it was not the case. And I was kind of surprised at how bureaucratic and how emotionally removed a lot of people were from their work and encouraged to be through methods, trainings, and things like this focus on objectivity. And it was very frustrating as a student. Um, here's another one. But part of that is also because, as he explained, it's true. Oh, wait, sorry, I started in the wrong um, place. My advisor said, You're a black person, and he is also a black person. His point of connection was to say that you, if you are black in this discipline, you're either a superstar and everyone is praising you for how awesome you are, or you're shit and you're not really a scholar. There's a lot more room for people who have various forms of privilege to be mediocre in ways that as a black scholar, you will not be allowed to occupy that space. And that was a direct encouragement from a faculty mentor of a student to not do engaged work, that you, that you kind of wouldn't make it. Um, So another space that I'm going to read some student quotes on is this, this really striking contradiction that came up in many of our interviews um, about universities and often from the top speaking to the values that we hold right, as community engaged scholars, work that's community engaged, work that is collaborative, that is equity based, but our structures in our institutions and think about how these map on to what has been shared about the way our institutions were formed that reward elite prestige and reward individualism, competition, assimilation, maintaining status quo. All these, you know, and our interviewees differently talked about colonialism or capitalism or et cetera, but as the point of our project was, we can't look at culture change in higher ed if we don't understand the culture and if we don't talk openly about the culture. So in the Leading and Learning Initiative, we wanna put a laser focus on the difference between the values we speak and the values that we're organized around. Like I said, in my experience coming to the New School, I realized every single motivation was individually and competitively structured. Um, and so we really looked at that in terms of faculty rewards. Um, I've, you know, in my time with Imagining America, I have to say it's very dispiriting, the amount of people that I meet and talk to who said, I came in to do engaged work in higher ed. I have all these visions and ideas, but I'm not really doing it anymore, or at least that way, because I realized I don't really fit in and it doesn't really work. So this contradiction is lived, right? So I'm going to share just a couple graduate student quotes. If people valued how much time it took to do this work, the university would give you a semester off. Another one, I think that some of my committee members saw my time as a public scholar as like a distraction from my real writing and research. But I would always, like when that came up, push back. I'm, it's like I'm getting paid to do a lot of this work, see through humanities and engaged scholarship grants. Um, and there's other ways for me to get this type of money, doing something else, and I'm going to do it. A third one, I think because it doesn't follow along those traditional pathways, they find it hard to find value in. And especially since I'm not looking for their value, this is not for them. This is for my community and me. And so that's a little bit of a discrepancy. And so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, um, and this is um, part, of the, part of the interviews, um, we then asked folks, well, how, you're talking about these contradictions in values and uh, how does it really land on the ground? Where does this happen for people? If we're to create models for change and strategies for people to create changes in their departments, where are you seeing it happen? So a lot of people describe the places, faculty meetings, uh, dissertation committees, um, review meetings, um, micro conversations in hallways. And uh, the, the ways that these values landed on the ground, um, and this is where we, we say culture is norms, behaviors, and roles. 
it came up in a lot of different ways, um, I would say, and, and we're continuing to explore how people are confronting these behaviors. But part of it was individual blockers. So there would be a committee of folks who really believed in a graduate student's work and dissertation, but there would be one person kind of stuck on holding ground and would say, you can't study yourself for your own community, as one example. Or they would say, where's the real data? Because <laughs> qualitative interviews and documentary work doesn't quite count, right? Um, and so a lot of the behaviors were in committee meetings by individual blockers. A, a whole other category was actually about bureau bureaucratic behaviors, not individual behaviors, but the behaviors of our institutions. I think many of us know how hard it can be to get funding out to community groups or even recognition for community groups for the work, the work and the research that's been done. So we kind of talked about these individual behaviors and also the institutional behaviors uh, that, that block the work. Um, so a lot of words that came up were naysayers, block blockers, gatekeepers, tokenism, bureaucracy, and a really beautiful conversation um, about, you know, one of our interviewees referenced Baldwin's The Price of the Ticket and talked about how graduate students and faculty of color, there's an additional level of challenges of constantly having to fit in to these structures and behaviors, and this is very specific for the humanities, that are actually really built on a white Western dominant norms in our actual discipline. So this isn't about individuals, right? We're not trying to look at this person was mean and this person was a blocker, but how do our institutional structures and actual disciplines promote a culture that leaves people out or that refuses to change? And so the idea of the Baldwin's price of the ticket is there's a deep emotional price to fit into a system that wasn't designed for you and that there's no room to actually change that system. And that's why folks have critiqued the assimilation approach of our institutions, because it's usually about how can you, how can we help you fit into this system? But now, how, not how can we look at decolonizing methodologies all entirely in the humanities, right? So instead it's the kind of, how can you fit into this norm? And we heard a lot and read a lot about how uh, in the humanities, a lot of the struggle that lands on the ground in norms, behaviors, and roles comes from actually our disciplinary norms, the canons, the ways of seeing, the ways of doing work, and what it means, right? Um, and so that, that, that was really central and important. We had a very high-level interviewees say, it's much easier changing departments than campuses in arts and design because they're actually much more used to working with clients and listening to their clients and other professionals in a fast paced way where they have to change the way they work. But the humanities often are centered, uh, cemented in the, um, we heard in multiple interviews, received knowledge of the field, right? And so for engaged scholars, there's a different way of doing work, essentially a different epistemology, a different understanding of what rigor is, of what a peer is. Um, and so this, this became very central. Um, and then, uh, and I won't speak to this at length, but it, this feels stressful, right? <laughs> it feels stressful. And in our engaged graduate student and junior faculty interviews, um, you know, it, it just is, you know, creates a sense of overwhelm, creates a sense of, should I really do this work? Does it really count? And for many people, uh, double duty. I'm gonna do the traditional dissertation, but then I'm gonna do this engaged work on the side. And so they're working double, triply hard. And then for students who come from communities in context with material needs, they're working jobs and doing their engaged work because from their communities that they care about so deeply, they wanna do that work and they wanna succeed in the pathway they've been told they have to succeed. So the, the despair, the panic, the overwhelm came up quite frequently, especially in the graduate student uh, interviews in space. Um, I'm going to close here before talking about some more positive things to close, <laughs> I promise, um, with what this all comes down to is about um, needing to have a more expansive understanding of what knowledge making can look like, right? And so um, if these are, these are quotes from people who, who believe their work was a distraction, it didn't count, and the people didn't really understand the deep value of it. The last quote I will point to, because it leads to the more positive cases, was a dean who did it, who, who was faculty for many, many, many years in the humanities, 
who described working with two sets of people. One are with the people who are resistant to support engaged work on their campuses. And her take was that if they understood they wouldn't lose anything, if they understood it wasn't a discrete pie, that they actually would warm up to and get even quite excited about people doing engaged work that required different methodologies, different forms of publication, different understandings of excellence, and that those people actually really need to be engaged and listened to and understood and cultivated. Because this fear and anxiety also comes from folks who came up through more traditional disciplines and are fearful, right? fearful of losing their way if resources are devoted to people doing things differently. The other group was for folks who might be doing deeply engaged work, but don't have peers and allies and think maybe that they're alone or that that work won't fit or won't matter. So building that space for peers and for folks to understand that the work matters is really important. And so in this space this is a long standing project for imagining America. We have a report out from 2009. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 2000. Um, yeah, 2009 called scholarship in public that looked at radically expanding our sense of scholarship in art design and humanities with an eye towards tenure and promotion. Um, and looked then as we are looking at now, how do we expand our colleagues and our peers and our institutions understanding of what is a peer? What is a peer who would deem work excellent? I know for many of your engaged work at Merced, you're probably talking to folks in your communities people on the water board, people in the neighborhood improvement district, people who are culture keepers in your community, uh, people in the cannabis industry. I read about all your projects. You want them to tell you if you got it right, right? So a whole different sense of who is a peer to determine if the work is excellent. A whole nother sense, as I mentioned before, about time and the time that it takes. A whole nother sense about what is rigor, what does rigor mean? And another sense about products. What do products of work look like? Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what kinds of products in your digital archives and other work that should actually matter and count as knowledge, right? And so what we're doing this coming year um, is we're moving from all of these problems and keeping them in mind and thought and deepening our understanding of these problems and looking nationally uh, because we are not the only ones who care about this work. We're not the only ones asking these questions. Uh, there are many networks, uh, leaders, associations, and there are many campuses, communities, departments, and programs like yours who care about this work and have actually already been change agents, been doing amazing work to validate this work on your campuses, both from the interpersonal to the structural. So this work is already happening. So what we want to do this coming year is capture the spaces uh, that are really exciting and hopeful and where change has been made on the scale both of um, well that's what i'm actually getting to now the various spaces we're going to look for and we're going to call forth looking for case studies and stories from our network um, so one of them is how do people organize this change we don't want to just document great centers and great projects but how have people on the ground spent their time and efforts and elbow grease to organize this change so I'm gonna go through just a couple great examples. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I wanna make sure we have at least a few minutes for questions. One of them is uh, what Maria Avila, who you see there in the second to right uh, person here, created a, a network in Imagining America called the Southern California Organizing Cluster. And she's an old IAF organizer. She has done organizing in the US-Mexico border in Arizona, kind of like the, you know, understand the issues, target them, organize. But what we don't understand about direct action organizing is it's actually deeply, deeply relational work. So she has translated her organizing expertise to building basically communities of care, communities of understanding, and communities of knowledge for folks doing engaged work across Imagining America's Southern California campuses and some campuses who are not members of IA as well. It's not limited. But this one on one work is literally one on one work. It's having relation, relational conversations saying, what do you most care about? What are you working on? What are you struggling with? And then doing that with 10, 15 more people every month and looking at the common issues and the common themes and then bringing people together for group discussions. It looks like all of us are struggling with blank. Let's now work on this together. 
And so this is a, a three, four year old network and they come together every month to share their issues, to share their concerns, to build cross-campus coalitions and understandings. Not unlike some of the work, uh, Robin, you have built across California, looking at how to support engaged work across the Central Valley, across our various UC campuses. It's not dissimilar from that. Um, and what they're doing is they're taking the idea of building power on individual campuses and across the network. So at Occidental College, they did what I just described with the one-on-ones and then the groups and actually changed their tenure and promotion and their grad advising policies entirely because the whole philosophy is you're never gonna make a proposal and create change by just putting it on the table. But if you look at both the supporters and the blockers that I've just been talking about, the gatekeepers in advance, what are you struggling with? With an empathetic heart to listening to everybody's issues and struggles, over the course of a year or two, you can understand what the real sticking points are and also where the real openings and opportunities are. So this is a, a really interesting relational organizing project in Southern California. I'll just say quickly, our publicly active graduate education network, I'm so thrilled that some of you all are here today. They're actually mostly not current fellows, but co-directors and past co-directors of PAGE, who will be sharing with you later, are building a similar peer support network to really uh, validate the work. We often hear at the end of the year um, that Paige Fellows and also our joy of giving something multimedia fellows talk about, I thought I was the only one doing this work. I thought I was the only one with these struggles. So this sense of collective networks and collective power is another beautiful space. Um, one that I'm super excited to look more into is founded at Michigan State by Christopher Long, a philosopher, and it's called the Humetrics Project. They actually have organizing teams going through campuses, it's now a multi-campus initiative, to almost monitor toxic culture. That's not the way they would describe it, but they have teams of caring folks who are basically walking around campuses and seeing how people are doing, even those that are upset and angry and not supportive, and really having one-on-one -on -one conversations about how we can be more embracing of work in the humanities and especially the engaged humanities and both understand how we can appreciate and understand the work better, but how we can build specific metrics for evaluating excellence in the work so that people are all on the same page when they review engaged work. So um, again, I'll just say, you know, there are many campus centers like yours and networks and spaces and associations like I met the MLA and the ACLS who are supporting this work through their own fellowships and amazing work um, and then we're inspired, inspired to also learn from folks like Nancy Cantor, Brian Murphy, others who are presidents and provosts who have made this a long haul project. And a lot of the work and why I say relational organizing is about bringing advocates and supporters into positions of power, you know, and doing this work over the long haul. An entirely different approach uh, that we found as quite important in common today and why we use the word activist is a great number of engaged grad students and faculty define their work as activist and radical and not public and engaged. And with that comes a very particular um, disruptive and as Moten would say, fugitive relationship to the university. Um, and many, many of you have probably read the Undercommons Fugitive Planning in Black Study, but this work by Fred Moten and Stefano Harney makes a very simple proposition that the large scale structures of our institutions won't change and that we will be co-opted and overly taxed to spend all of our time working the system or making our way up through the system but rather we should create radical spaces of hope radical spaces of care and take as you see here to take and the word is often used steal resources from the university to bring out to our communities so in our research, I'm calling it the activist stance, the radical stance. And there are many really exciting, amazing projects in this work that I'd like to briefly mention. Um, Ananya Roy at the Institute for Inequality and Democracy at UCLA is bringing resources to community activists. They have an activist scholar in residence project. They also have research on housing and housing justice where they're building up housing activists as scholars and funding them like they fund graduate students and scholars to be collaborative researchers alongside university scholars and taking a real activist stance against gentrification and around housing justice. Um, there's a really great project in Vancouver I'm interested in looking into called the Right to Remain. That's another project of university and community thought leaders and scholars that are trying to change the IRB 
to uh, be approved and recognized by community-based scholars so that our research is done in the ethic and the views of the community-based folks. So there's many other forms of this. Uh, I don't know if you know Scholars for Social Justice, but this is also a space that believes that we won't always do all the work we need to do through our institutions. And thus we need to build alliances with movements and create thought communities with communities as equal part leaders alongside us, not just working within uh, our own institutions. And then finally, um, as I close out, um, an interesting area that we're gonna look at, um, these are quotes that I'll read to you really quickly and it might be somewhat surprising. Um, are, I'll, I'll read them real quickly. One is working between the community and the board. I need to read everyone at all levels to figure out how to frame things. It's like walking on a tightrope, sometimes misstepping and falling into landmines. A different person. No other time in my life have I had to dichotomize myself in two, me and the leadership's beliefs. I need to understand both where I stand and find ways to work between the two. Finally, a third person. It's just such a different perspective and environment that I find my own values being pushed and challenged. I started to, it started to really wear on me to get to me. And I didn't even realize what was going on. It was in my subconscious. I made this presentation at UC Davis about foundation program officers, Sean. <laughs> And it was about foundation program officers who are former community organizers, uh, educators, service providers, about their struggles to get grassroots community development and organizing work funded through their more mainstream conservative institutions. I was making this presentation and all of a sudden, two separate university uh, officers came up to me and said, this is me, you're speaking to me. I came up as faculty. I used to be an organizer in my previous life. I believe in the students. I believe in the faculty's community engaged projects. But by the time I get it to the top, I have to translate it a different way to get it through to policy. And I'm getting beat up from the bottom from the student organizers and I'm getting beat up from the top for the leaders who don't want to approve this, that or the other. Um, but I still believe in this work. I'm doing this work, but it's exhausting. Uh, it's beyond code switching. It's the true brokering, negotiating work of institutional change. And it cuts across most of our institutions. And we really want to look this coming year in the Leading and Learning Initiative at those lifelong, die hard institutional change agents who believe in community engaged work, who believe in uh, the humanities, arts, and design in a time right now where these departments are getting defunded, honestly. Where tenure is at risk, especially for folks who do community engaged work uh, in smaller humanities departments. And so we, we really want to study almost like life histories, these brokers who have made really important change um, in their institutions. So we're looking at diversity officers, provosts, deans, um, and people who are lifelong inside outsiders who understand <laughs> how to broker change uh, from the institutions from the inside out. Um, so that's something we're looking at. And then finally, what we're gonna look at, and then I will, this is it, I promise, is the kind of work you're doing and the kind of work everyone across our Imagining America network's doing in the actual humanities projects, the actual arts projects, the actual design projects. This is from the closing of our Imagining America National Gathering in Chicago. And I love it so much because we're all walking to the closing plenary together, uh, following a marching band from Chicago. And here you have nonprofit leaders, musicians, in the pink shirt, you have our former provost, Ralph Hexter, and behind him in the pink sweatshirt, you have Bill Ayers, the, one of the founders of the Weather Underground. You probably can't get more radical than that, smiling alongside our provost. And Milman Harrison, our colleague, is in the back there somewhere, and students laughing and joyous. And the reason I love the picture so much is because what I haven't talked enough about today, but what is so exciting about the program in front of us that you will get throughout the rest of the conference is the real powers in the work. The real power is in the stories people are telling, the joy we get from being with one another, being with community and lifting history, sing, sitting together and using the methods of narrative, of storytelling, of images, of digital work to imagine a better future. And so the real power is in the work you're doing and continuing to do it 
despite the challenges and in the context of all the great organizing work going in campuses and centers and communities to lift and connect the work across the national network. So I was so pleased to look at a bold few blocks, the digital preservation work, both for indigenous communities and architecture, looking at power as it runs through water and transport and the cannabis industry in the San Joaquin Valley, lifting indigenous voices, um, the arts and culture work in Merced that I got to see on the stage through the Rural Justice Summit. So the real power is in the work that you're all doing. So this coming year, as I mentioned, you'll see from Imagining America, a call for case studies for you to tell your own stories about the great work you're doing and why it matters. That's what's really gonna create the change, is lifting the work that's addressing the public pressing issues of our time. And I don't need to tell you that we have a great many. <laughs>